Rhema will make you do what you thought you couldn't do. See, there's one thing. We got the word of God on the inside of us, but then the rhema comes on the outside of us and make us do what God said. <laughs> Amen. When you hear that rhema, you just got to change. You just got to do what the word says. And I'm telling you, rhema was just flowing. That was rhema. That was straight from how I was hearing some things I never heard before. Glory to God. I was seeing some things I never seen before. Amen. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God was speaking, and some of you are going to be doing some things that you never thought possible. Some of you moving out, and that song was so appropriate. We're moving out of the natural. We're going up into the supernatural. You're going to be doing some supernatural things you never thought you would do. See, it's going to go past your mind. Whatever you're thinking right now, that's not it. It's going to supersede that. It's going to be something that, you know, I like that scripture that says change is going to happen so fast your head is going to be swimming. Some things God's going to be pouring out blessings upon blessings upon blessings, and you, they're going to come so quickly your head is going to spin. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> but God spoke some things. He, let me just say this because some of you are at a crossroads right now. Now, I don't know if I'm going to get to my message either, but <laughs> some of you are at a crossroads right now. And you don't know what to do because where you are is not producing anything. But you're afraid to go forward. Where you are, I'm going to say that again, where you are is not producing anything. But you're afraid to go forward. You think if you go forward, you're going to die. But if the Bible says that if you sit there, you're going to die. And then brought me to the scripture in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. It says, now, four men who were lepers at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we will die also. So they're at a crossroad. What should I do? Should I go forward or should I stay right here? Because either way, I'm going to die. Either way, it doesn't look good. Either way, I don't know. I, I, I'm surely going to die if I sit here. And I'm fearing that I'm going to die if I go forward into the city. And so some of you are at a crossroads like that. See, and, and you're dying is, is you're sitting here not producing a child of God, when they don't produce, they die, spiritually speaking, because we were meant for increase. We were meant to move forward. We were meant to have greater, you know, and we're not meant to be at a standstill. So that means we're dying when we sit still. But then we're looking ahead, and God is saying some things, but we're afraid to take hold of those things. We're afraid to move from this spot that we're in right now for fear we might drown, for fear we might get in over our heads, for fear we might die. But let's see what happened to the lepers. And they were lepers. Nobody in here is a leper. Next verse. And they rose at twilight. See, they got tired of their circumstance. See, some of you need to have some holy dissatisfaction where you're at right now and get up and move. Don't matter what time it is. Says so at twilight, they rose to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirt of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. Come on. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. That wasn't true, but they were hearing things. God made them think that. God confused the enemy. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight. 
At the same time the lepers made the decision to move, the enemy moved. <laughs> Glory to God. And they left the camp, look, intact. Their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. <sighs> I'm telling you, when God is on your side, your enemy doesn't have a chance. Your enemy doesn't have an opportunity to, to make a decision whether or not we're going to fight. The enemy has no defense against a child of God. You got to stop letting the devil beat you up because you got to stop being afraid of the devil because the devil is afraid of you. The devil is afraid of your God. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. See, they thought that when they got there, they was going to die. They was going to get killed by the Syrians. But look what happened. Just because they went, just because they decided not to sit there and die, and go. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a good day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. See, they still, still had a little twisted thinking. Now, therefore, come let us go and tell the king's household. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but what happened after that was nothing short of a miracle. They began to come into things they never thought they would. They thought it was going to be famine. Instead, they found what? Plenty. They found plenty. See, that's why you can't be afraid to step out. That's why you can't be afraid to step out on faith when God tells you. When God tells you to do something, just go do it. What you going to do otherwise? Just sit there and die, sit there and twiddle your thumbs, sit there and watch television and eat bonbons and gain 50 pounds? What are you going to do? Are you going to step out and do that business, get into the ministry, push the church's agenda forward? Or are you just going to sit there? And Pastor Robert says something key about the houses. He was talking about how we think too small. We think too small. We, we think like this. Huh, okay, I'm getting a house, but how am I going to sustain it? I got to say, I can't break off God a big offering. I can't break him off the tithe because I need all my money to pay for this house. You think too small. You don't have God's thoughts. See, because it is he that gives you the power to get wealth. It's not you. And so if he gave you that house, he's going to sustain the house. You have no business trying to sustain that house. The only business you have is giving to the house of God so the house of God can be sustained. God takes care of your house. You think too small. You're thinking about things you shouldn't even be thinking about. God can never work in your life like that. See, there's some supernatural things that are about to happen in this ministry that's going to blow your mind. If you're not ready for it, it's going to blow your mind. And it's to the tunes of thousands and maybe millions of dollars. And while I was standing there, God spoke to me and said, just like some of you think it, think, oh man, how did he say it? See, you thought it was a big thing when you wrote out a check for $100 as an offering. You thought that was a big thing. See, but you're not going to be writing out $100 checks. The anointing on this ministry is that just like somebody writes out a $100 check and don't flinch, you're going to be writing out a $1,000 check and not flinching. $1,000 check, that's going to be the norm. 
And I'm not talking about some distant future. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about this Sunday. You're about to write a thousand dollar check and not flinch. And not flinch. I'm about to do that myself. <laughs> Glory to God. Because I understand when I sow bountifully, I'm going to reap bountifully. But hold on. I don't have to wait to reap. I don't have to wait to reap. The fact that I can write the $1,000 checkout means I already got a harvest. And there's more harvest to come on that seed. But I'm telling you, we've got to start sowing like where we want to go. Like we've already arrived. Because truly we have. And see, it's going to be the people in this ministry that take this gospel to the world. We're not going to have a want. We're not going to have to go on TV and beg for money. Oh, please send in money or we going off the air. That's not our confession. That's not our confession. God's paying that bill. And he's paying that bill through the faithful giving of people like you that's ready to go to the next level, that's not letting anything stop them, that's not having any limitations on their life or their pocketbook. See, and some of you don't understand that. Some of you are looking at me like this. When's she going to preach her message? I am preaching my message. <laughs> then you said, when are you going to let us sit down? I don't know. <laughs> if you can sit, sit. If you can't, just stay standing up. But see, God, and, and see, it's right. We got to be standing at attention when God is talking like that. I'm telling you, Pastor Robert and I were at a conference over the last few days. First, before that, last week, we were down at Victory. And they had asked us to speak um, down there on Friday. But it was a celebration of their, uh, their, their Victory Virginia Church's 12th anniversary, but also their new building dedication. And their new building is about 200,000 square feet. I don't know. I don't know if you understand that in terms of square feet, but this building is about 21,000 square feet. That one's 200,000 square feet. And so they were celebrating because God did. And you know, they didn't have, they, they have like 2,600 seats in there, like 2,600 seats in that building, in the sanctuary. They don't have that many members. But they do have that many members because they already saw it. And that's why God blessed them with that facility. See, somebody that doesn't have that kind of faith would not be able to come into things like that, would not even have the heart to come into things, would think, how are we going to sustain this? How are we going to do this? We don't have enough people. We don't have enough money. Pe People with faith don't think like that. They don't talk like that. They know who sustains it. They know that it's God. They, it's either all God or nothing. Saying God wants to take some property back because it belongs to him. But I'm telling you, it was so supernatural down there. And just, just coming from there and then going to the conference, God specifically spoke to us at the conference about what was going to happen with our ministry. It was so specific. And, Mike, we were at the IPMC conference. It was over in New Jersey. And um, he specifically spoke to us about how it was going to happen and what was going to happen. And he spoke it through some of the people there that was preaching who were in the same predicament that we're in right now. But where they are now is so far beyond where they were at the same time 
that we are here right now. It was amazing. It was astounding. And I, we, we left there, and we were just looking at each other like, my God, look what the Lord is doing. See, it was not one person that was in there, in that place, that was about to, their ministry was about to go worldwide. Although there was many nations in that, in that um, conference. It's an international pastors and ministers conference. So they had every nation practically represented there. And what they do, that church, they, they fly them over here. And they pay for everything. And they put them up in hotels and they feed them just to bring them over here so they could get exposed to the word of God and bring it back to their nations. And we heard so many testimonies of healing. We heard uh, cancer uh, uh, being healed, like, you know, uh, a person that had um, like stage four cancer being healed. We heard some other miraculous stories that, that people were experiencing because they connected with this ministry and because of the word that was being preached. And, you know, like Pastor Robert said, we met some people from different countries, and we have been going there for a few years, several years, and we already know people from these other countries. But I'm telling you, it was nothing like this time where we're about to go worldwide in 200 countries. Nobody there was about to take that step. Nobody in that entire, there was thousands of people there. Not one of them was about to take the step that we're taking. Whether their ministry was small or large, none of them. And we were just astounded by what God was doing because the testimony of that man to say, he said, I had 12 members, 12 members, and he was confessing that God told them to go to the world, told them to go to the world on television, told them when the, he said, and the people just, it was quiet, like, like they didn't believe it. But he kept confessing it, kept confessing it. And of course, over the years, the ministry grew a little, you know, but not like it grew when he stepped foot on television. And from one point on, when he stepped foot, I'm telling you, the numbers he quoted were astronomical. Astronomical. And now they have, they're all over the world on television and they have 600 and something employees. 600 and something employees. There was a woman who, she was making um, $200,000 or more working in marketing. She quit her job, went to the work for the ministry. Wait a minute, hold on. You think she was making good money, $10 an hour on the phone. God sent that woman to that ministry with all that expertise. And she was willing to accept $10 an hour. And I know she increased from there. But I'm just telling you, God's going to begin to send people that, like Pastor Robert said, that are our kind, that connect with us, that, that you know, they just resonate with us. They have the same spirit as us. But they didn't know us. But God had to bring us to them so that they could know us. Just like God brought you here and you met us and you knew us and you knew you had to connect there because you were our kind. Glory to God. You were just like, like, like our spirits connected. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. And we don't know the numbers. We don't know the, the you know, calculations or whatever. And we don't even care. We're not even banking on that. But what we're doing is just stepping out, and that includes all our partners, stepping out on the word that God gave us, and we're going to watch him do his thing. We're going to watch him take us to the world. But look, that's what happened when Jesus came. 
You know, you would never think Jesus would use this little baby in the manger. But Jesus changed the world. And that's the power of one. Amen? Amen. I think I can teach a little bit of that. So we're going to start off just a little bit of this message because I'm not going to keep you all night. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about this. And it has everything to do with what we just talked about. The power of one is very significant. One person in this room can change the world. So, Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you are about to bless us with more rhema tonight. And I thank you, Lord God, that people will begin to see and hear those things that they haven't saw and heard before. But they will realize that it's you that's talking to them and telling them to move out. Go out into the deep. And God, we know what's waiting for us when we get there. It's either something that's already there or God, you're going to do a miracle when we get there. So we thank you, Father, for this word that's about to be released. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Come on. If you agree with it, say amen. Amen. All right, take your seat real quick. See, the power of one. We talked about it last week, and we talked about influence. That was our main focus on influence, how influential one person can be, how one person can change somebody's life, how just your influence, just what you say, just what you do can literally change someone's life. And then not only that, because of your influence changing that person's life, then there's a ripple effect because that person will change somebody else's life and that person will change somebody else's life. So there's a ripple effect that happens. And that's how one person can change the world. Now, the Holy Spirit is is being released these days with, you know, his fullness. And see... You know, some people, they just come to church just because it's a nice thing to do. But God is doing some awesome awesome things in these days. This is not church as usual. This is not religion. This is God, God's agenda being placed in our hands so that we can move it forward in the earth. And a lot of people think that Um, You know, the church is in the world, and the church is subject to the world. But that was never God's intention. God's intention was that the church now would lead the world. And the world would facilitate what the church is doing. Not the reverse. And so the church is meant to have a prominent place Not just place, but to have the dominion over this world. But see, the church hasn't been acting like that. The church has been out of place. The church has been just thinking they're a part of the world. But that was never God's intention. God's intention was never for to create a world that people would just be on it running amok and doing whatever they wanted to do. God, that was not God's intention. His intention was to, for the church to flourish in the earth, for the church to spread in the earth, and for the church to be the rule in the earth. And see, because of, you know, all the, um, the errors and all of the things that people really didn't understand about God and, you know, how far away we were from God, it got twisted. And now it seems like the world is in charge of everything when the church should be the one who's dominant in the earth. And so our job as believers is that we would make an impact that would be felt by this world, pushing God's agenda forward, pushing God's agenda and not hindering the anointing of God. See, a lot of times, because we don't do that, we're hindering God's anointing in the earth. 
See, we think if we just sit there and we just don't do anything, but we'd be nice, you know, we're doing something for God. But we're really hindering the anointing. See, because the anointing wants to come in and do some things. The anointing wants to come in and change some things. The anointing wants to come in and take situations and make them bow the knee to Jesus Christ. You know, the anointing wants to, to do the things and, and, and get the agenda done that God wants in this earth. But a lot of times we hinder that because we don't do what God is telling us to do. And that's why God is saying to us now, launch out into the deep. So don't worry because I'm there. Where, where, where the deep is, that's where I am. God doesn't, doesn't live in the shallow waters. <laughs> he lives in the deep waters. And so then we got to think about the effect that we have on others. Remember I said that. That's the most valuable thing that, one of the most valuable things that you have is your influence, the effect that you have on other people. See, if you, if you always bow to their agenda or, you know, you leave the room because people are doing certain things that you don't like or whatever, you know, that's not what God intended. You know, like Pastor Robert said, he didn't come to take a look. He came to take over. That's what God intends for us to do, to come in and take over. And I'm not saying you beat people up and you, you know, you hit them over the head with the Bible and all that kind of stuff. But you go in with your agenda and you don't let them change you. You don't let this culture and its superficial customs get on you. That's why the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind because we are not to be like this world. We are not to do the things that the world do, not because they're bad things, but because that's not God's agenda. We be not conformed to this world, but transform. We transform. See, once before we got saved, we were conformed to this world. We were just like this world. We went along with everything they had to say and do. We thought it was great. You know, we couldn't wait to climb the ladder of success. We couldn't wait, you know, to get those things that the world had to offer. You know, we, we, we were going along with the world. But then when we got saved, God said, now be ye transformed. Change. And that's not just change. That, that's actually going from one state to another state of being. Like you're not even the same anymore. Nobody would recognize you. And that's the kind of transformation he's talking about. And so he wants us to take that transformation to the world and let that influence have a ripple effect in this world. And that the lives you touch, one person touch lives that will ultimately change thousands of lives. And see, Pastor Robert and I, we're going on the Word Network. We're going on all, um, to millions of people. Glory to God. And we're just one. You know, we're just one. He's one. I'm one. Just one person. But it's about to have a ripple effect in the world. And so one thing that we did now has the power to change lives. See, and, you know, today's church, they're always trying to be, you know, minister to, oh, we got to minister to the culture, the current culture that's out here now. We got to get the millennials, and we got to minister right to where they are and all this stuff. Since when did the gospel change that we can't minister the same way that we've been ministering through the power of the Holy Ghost? Since when? So we can't change because of culture. See, when people really get hit by the Spirit of God, they don't care nothing about no culture. They don't care how old you are. They don't care how young you are. They don't care about any of that stuff, but they care about what the Holy Spirit is doing, how he's working in my life. And so we've got to understand that we are meant to transform. But one thing you need to know, I, I, I heard this quote, think twice before you speak. 
because your words and influence will plant the seed of either success or failure in the mind of another. Be careful what you say to people. See, that's your influence, what you say. And even in the Bible, in Proverbs 18:21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. And so we, we got to understand that words have power. The words that come out of your mouth can literally build somebody up or destroy them. And so we've got to be careful about our influence. We've got to be careful about what we say. And you know, it's subtle. It's subtle, particularly with Christians. Because sometimes you'll say something to make somebody think, oh, I thought they was a Christian. That's your influence. If something you say that comes out of your mouth is questionable, makes people think, whether <laughs> twice about whether or not you're a Christian, then something's wrong with your influence. See, what you say out of your mouth is important. Think twice before you say something. Don't just run off at the mouth saying any old thing because you're influencing people. And that influence has what? A ripple effect. Glory to God. And so, because of what just one person does, someone else's life is changed. Let's go to Romans 5.18, and let's see how important that was, is. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Just through one man's offense, judgment came to everybody, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteousness, act the free gift came to all men. One man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men. One man, one righteous act, free gift came to everybody resulting in justification of life. Now let's look at 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Amen. So what is your influence? Is it an influence of disobedience to the word of God? You know, again, it's subtle. You could be a Christian coming to church every Sunday, looking like Pastor Robert says, you just left God for coffee and donuts. Every Sunday, lifting your hands, worshiping, praising God, but you never move out on what God has called you to do. You know all the right words, hallelujah, amen, glory to God. You know all those cliches. You know all the right things to say, but you never move out on what God called you to do. You never really say, God, I'm going to do what you called me to do. You never step out and do that. So thereby, the influence you have is limited. So by one man's disobedience, because par partial obedience is really disobedience. I'm obedient. I go to church. I lift my hands up. I praise God. I love God. But I'm not doing what he said. That's disobedience. By one man's disobedience. What does it say? Many were made sinners. So by your influence, many people follow suit. Well, she's not doing what God called her to do. I'm not going to do what God called me to do. I, I'm just going to sit here in church and I'm going to look just like she looks. She looks okay. Lightning bolts not striking her dead. Bad things are not happening to her life, so I'm going to do the same thing. You see? Says, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So, not only am I coming to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time the door is open, glory to God, because, you know, I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
I'm, I'm doing that, and I'm coming in. I'm giving my tithes, my offerings, worshiping God, doing what, what every Christian should do. Not only am I doing that, but I'm stepping out in the gifts that God has planted in me and doing those things that he has called me to do. I'm singing on the praise team. I'm playing in the band. I'm doing the work in the media. I'm preaching. I'm doing all those things that God has called me to do. See, but some of you, those things he called you to do are even more than that. And you're about to step into those things. See, it's on your heart and it's on your mind. You know, you've been, you've been working di diligently. You've been, you've been just putting your hands to the plow and not looking back and just doing those things that God, has, the pastors have asked you to do. But God's calling you out into the deep. God's telling you to take some steps. And see, the more steps you take, the more steps other people will take. That's how it works. That's how we get the kingdom of God's agenda in this earth. Because of what you do, it sends a signal to everybody else. Because of what I don't do, that sends a signal to everybody else. And so, it says that we all have to have a vision. We all have to have goals. God made all of us goal-oriented. And the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, without vision, people perish. So if you don't have a vision, I'm going to go uh, one step further. Without fulfilling the vision, people perish. Because you can have a vision that God gave you, but you're not fulfilling it. You're not taking one step towards it. And you're perishing. Just like those men who were sitting. It wasn't until they got up and faced their fear that they came into everything that they thought they couldn't have. And so God wants us to know that Without a vision, without stepping out into this vision, we're going to perish. That's why Pastor Robert and I are always casting vision. Not just for ourselves, but for you. So you can catch your vision. You see us fulfilling vision, then you're going to fulfill vision. You see us taking steps of faith, then you're going to take steps of faith. You see us doing things, going out into the deep, you're going to come out into the deep. Glory to God. And so it's all about influence. One person's influence can change the world. And so we don't have time for complacency. We don't have time to be lazy, insecure, fearful. Those things shouldn't even be in your, your, your vocabulary. It's time out for all that stuff. Time out for all that stuff. You be coming to church. People come to church looking uh oh, I just need God to deliver me from the spirit of fear. He already did. He already delivered you from that spirit. Now it's time to do something. Now it's time to launch out into the deep. You know, you're letting the spirit of fear hold you back when it doesn't have to. You don't come to church just to get delivered from the spirit of fear, just to get healed. God already healed you. He sent Jesus, and by his stripes, you were healed already. Now get to work. Get about doing God's business in this earth. I feel like that's what God wants to say sometimes. Like, come on now. I already did it for you. Let's get to work. Let's get the job done. And so God won't do anything for you that you can do for yourself. Amen. If there's some things you can do for yourself, do them. But don't sit around waiting for God to do it. Because he's not doing it. He's already light years ahead of you. He's waiting for you to do those things that you can do. So now he can do the things that he can do. Oh, man. I feel like, you know, God's getting, no, God doesn't get frustrated. He has patience. But he wishes, above all things, that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Above all things, 
and he delights in the prosperity of his people. Now, our church has a vision. What is our vision? Abundant Life Family Church is a multicultural, family-oriented Christian worship church that teaches the abundant life, thus growing whole people, body, soul, and spirit, who prosper in all that we do, reach, showing God's love to everyone, and reaching the lost at any cost. That's our vision. We have to have vision in order to fulfill that vision. But even throughout that vision, there's, there's something that, that you got a key on there, that we want to show the love of God to everyone. That's the core of that, that vision, that we would show the love of God to everyone and that we would fulfill that scripture in John 10.10. Because the enemy will come and he'll try to steal from us. He'll try to steal vision. He'll try to steal everything that you believe in God for. He'll try to steal your health. He'll try to steal anything from you. In John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. It says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. More abundantly. But look what it says here. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. See, but some people, they don't have to have the thief come to do it. See, that, that word when it says my people perish, for, uh, if you don't have vision, what? Hmm? You perish. If you don't have vision, you perish. So the devil really doesn't have to steal anything from you because you're already being destroyed, already being per perishing because not the lack of vision, lack of fulfilling the vision. You're perishing. The devil doesn't have to steal that from you. Now, some of us are hindering the work of God. Right now. You're hindering the work of God right now. God told you to do something tonight. It could have been God told you to write a bigger check than what you wrote. God told you to put more on the mobile app than what you put on there. But you didn't because whatever reason, you're hindering the work of God. I know it's quiet in here. See, the church was never meant to be a place for nice people to come together and get nicer. It was never meant for that. Sometimes I think we think that. Like, we're all nice, and we just want to get nicer. And if people come in that aren't nice, then we don't want them in our little club. We don't want them sitting next to us. We don't want to be bothered with them because we're all nice. We're nice people. But see, that's not a picture of the church. How many know Jesus was not nice? Oh, I heard a hush. <laughs> what do you mean Jesus wasn't nice? Jesus wasn't that nice now. He went into that temple and turned over those tables. Is that nice? Would you do that? That's not nice. He, went, he, he called the the disciples, he, he, I mean, not the disciples, the Pharisees, he said, your father is the devil. Is that nice? He called them a bunch of hypocrites, sepulchers. He said, you're rotting on the inside. You know, he, he often <laughs> told people about themselves. Was that nice? So why are we worried about being so nice all the time? See, the Bible says he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And so we have the wrong idea about Jesus. I'm not saying Jesus was a roughneck. I'm not saying he was a thug. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying, his agenda was not to be nice. His agenda was to come up against the enemy, cast out devils, heal the sick. How many know that's not nice? But we've got to get... We got to get unnice 
and get into the trenches and deal with devils. And how many know if I say, devil, please leave, he's not going to go? I got to bind him. I got to cast him. I got to tell him. I got to demand that he leaves or I'm going to kick him out. I know we've been praying for people, and I want you to continue to pray for the people in this church that no devil, no spirit of infirmity will overtake their bodies and try to take them out of this world prematurely. We're lifting up a standard against that. We're lifting up a standard against the devil, and we are telling him he has no rights to the bodies of the children of God. And he's not going to take it because we're going to kick him out. And see, Jesus didn't have time to be nice because he was on a journey. He was on a mission to kick the devil out. And you can't be nice when you're doing that. And so some of us got to get our minds straight, our minds renewed when we're talking about dealing with kingdom. You know, because there's a lot of devils. As we go up further, you know that saying? New levels, new devils. There's worse devils as you go up in in God and in the things of God. So we've got to be praying. We've got to be, you know, praying in the spirit and doing battle in the spirit realm and not thinking, oh, everything is rosy and nice. See, we've got a job to do to influence the world. And we're not going to get that done by being nice. And I know I'm blowing some people's theology that you think you should be nice all the time. And I'm not saying uh, nice is not the same thing as, I'm not saying being rude. You have to be rude and obnoxious. Don't be rude and obnoxious. Look, but don't take no for an answer. Don't let anybody take advantage when we have the advantage. Walk in God's favor unashamedly. See, we've got to understand that we are ambassadors for Christ. Where's my scripture for ambassadors? Glory to God. I think it's found in 2 Corinthians. Somebody find that scripture for me because I'm skipping down. Uh Uh-huh. Here it is. 2 Corinthians 5.20. says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. Let me see the New Living Translation. It says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. See, we are called, and I'm going to skip some of this, and we're going to pick up next week. We are called to reconcile this world to God. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's our job. And as ambassadors for the kingdom of God, we are making God's appeal through us. Through us, God is speaking. And we are appealing to the world. We're persuading them to come back to God. God wants the world to come back to him. He wants it reconciled unto him. See, he reconciled us back to Jesus, and now he's given us that job to go out and reconcile the world, not to just be nice. And so when we talk about outreach, when we're talking about bringing people to church, bringing people to the kingdom of God, Look, that's our main job. Our main job isn't to be a greeter or usher or work in children's ministry. Our main job is to reconcile people back to God. As ambassadors, we are pleading with you to come back to God. And we can't get that done just through being, you know, working in the church. We've got to be a church without walls. We've got to understand who we are. And we've got to stop trying to be nice all the time. We've got to invade the devil's kingdom just like he's trying to invade ours. Look, he's scared of us. We've 
we got to stop saying, oh, I saw the devil. The devil was on my trail. And, you know, I was doing my best just to get away from him. The devil better get away from you because when you know who you are, he's scared of you. You don't have to be scared of him. Since when was the Holy Spirit scared of the devil? Did you ever see the Holy Spirit all beat up and bruised from the devil? No. You got to have bite marks from the devil? No. The Holy Ghost, there's no match. He, the devil is no match for the Holy Ghost. As soon as the Holy Ghost comes on the scene, there's no demon power. There's no demon power. And so we got to understand that. We got to stop running from the devil. And we got to be about our father's business. We are ambassadors for Christ. He's got to be pleading through you to bring others back to Christ. See, that's the power of one. That you as one person would reconcile someone back to Christ. And that they would reconcile somebody back to Christ. And that they would reconcile somebody back to Christ. And there would be a ripple effect on this earth if every one of us reconciled at least one person back to Christ. And if we did that, if we committed to do that today, this church would be packed. We wouldn't have one empty seat. And so I hear God saying, don't wait till you go on TV to fill this place up. Fill it up now. Reconcile somebody back to me now. So that's our assignment. Let's stand to our feet. That when we do that, whew, that ripple effect will be felt throughout this community. You know, it's this church that they moved to this area where there was nothing happening. Like the city was like dead, and they didn't even want that church in that area. But the church went to the board 17 times and got turned down 17 times. But they never gave up. <clears throat> and on the 18th time, they said yes. Now that church has thousands of members now. Didn't have it then, but now. They have thousands of members. And this little town that had nothing there, like nobody wanted to live there, is booming now because of that church in that area. The church members are buying homes in that area like at a, at a phenomenal rate. They have been for several years. Now they just broke ground for a, a, a humongous mall right across the street from the church. And when I'm saying humongous, I mean like a mall like, um, like what? Like Franklin Mills or King of Prussia Mall. A mall like that. King of Prussia Mall. Can you imagine a little tiny town that didn't even have much of a population. People didn't want to move there. People didn't want to live there. It wasn't even really on the map. And they didn't want anybody coming in there to disrupt their little town. But when that church opened up, that town began to boom because of that church's influence. Because of the influence the church had. And they're continuing to build there. And so now the, the city is getting on board. And they want to build around the church now. <laughs> they want to build something because they know that the power of God is there. And that people, see, see their agenda is just money. But they understand, they see that powerful presence there in that community that's going to affect all their sales, all those stores. It's going to be flooded, restaurants, all kinds of 
you know, stores and things they have there. We're going to be a church like that. We're going to be a church like that. See, we're not ashamed or, or intimidated to say that. Not one bit. Not embarrassed. Not insecure about it. But we're going to be a church like that. Like Pastor Robert said, we're about to build something in this community. Amen. From the ground up. From the ground up. And God even said, if the people at the church don't, don't want to do that, I'm going to send some that do. I hate to say it, he said that. All right. <laughs> you could get on board if you want to. But see, God doesn't have a shortage of anything. It's up to us to just get on board to what he's doing so that we can see the supernatural in our lives. And it's going to start by you influencing one other person. One other person. Let me see next Wednesday that the attendance in here doubles. Just bring one person with you next week. Just one. That's everybody's assignment for next week. Bring one person. And if you're a couple, you got to bring two. Amen. See, because it's individual, Amen. what God is doing. Your influence is different from your wife's influence or your husband's influence. Bring one person with you next week, and we're going to see what happens, what God is going to do. I'm telling you, it's going to be phenomenal. God's going to increase us more and more, and our light is going to shine more and more. And I just keep hearing that we are a city on a hill, glory Amen. to God. That we are salt in the earth, glory to God. Yes. That we're going to make a difference in this community and in this world. Look, something, something so obscure that wasn't even on the map. A church that nobody even ever heard of. It's about to change the world. Amen about to change the world. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. We give you praise in this place. We thank you for the time that we had together tonight, God. We thank you for your rhema word that, that came, God, and we received it, God. And now we're able to walk in that word. God, we won't be afraid to move out of our complacency, Lord God, and walk out into the deep where you would have us go, God, because we know that you, you're going to meet us there, God. Either something's there for us to get or you're going to meet us there and make it happen. So we thank you, God, right now that everyone under the sound of my voice is on the move for you and that we will be influencers for the kingdom of God. We will be those ambassadors being Christ to people, reconciling them to God. So tonight, God, we thank you. We didn't know what was going to happen tonight, but we do know that you moved on our behalf. And God, we'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a shout. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. And you know, tonight, I'm just going to do one thing before we go. I'm going to open the doors of the church. Anyone wants to be a part of this ministry, you want to officially join this ministry, you want to be a part of this ministry, because, you know, some things that you heard that God is doing, and you want to be a part of that. If you, you're a visitor, or you've been here visiting for a while, and you are not a member, and amen, we should have some visitors. If that's you, and you want to be a part of this ministry, just wave your hand at me. Come on up. Oh, praise God. Come on up. Come on. Anybody else? Any other visitors? I don't like to take for granted that we're all members on Wednesday night. Amen. Let's give God a praise. Come on. Rest in. This is Deja. Dede. This is Dede, and she's coming to be with us. 
Um, she's going to be a full member at Abundant Life. Amen. And wait. She's from Liberia. But she lives here now. But I'm telling you, God is going to send us people from all over the world. So just welcome her to Abundant Life. She's, she's excited about it. I already talked to her about it. And I'm, we're excited to have you. We thank God for you. Your life will never be the same. Amen. If you could go with Deacon Natalie, and she'll tell you what to do next. Amen. So let's raise our hands for the dismissal. Say, I love the Lord with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I love my neighbor as myself. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you on.